I find it really great that your grandpa has maintained his camper so well. What year is it again? I think it's from 2027 or so. <laughs> anyway, he's still proud of having bought one of the first e-drive campers back then. <laughs> Over 16 years old then. Not bad at all. And we're going to the European Championships in Spain with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll just close my eyes for a bit. You can wake me up at the next stop, then I'll take over again. Hey, enough sleep. It's your turn again. Oh, man, I was totally out cold. Can you put my wallet in the glove compartment? Will do. Hey, there's a wallet in here already. What are all these cards? Oh, my grandfather kept all the access cards for the various charging providers. He always thinks he might need them again. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but since we have the European Energy Union, you can pay with your user ID at all charging points in Europe, right? Yeah, but I think that if you experience charging in person before the EU, then you'll know why he kept them. <laughs> Every country used to do its own thing. And then you'd stand around like an idiot in front of a charging station that you can't pay for. I think my grandfather's generation still experienced what dependence means. <laughs> Why dependence? Well, the energy union was founded because after the crises in the 2020s, it was clear that we had to be independent of gas or oil. And that meant, on one hand, decentralising the energy supply... The 10 million solar panels. ...and to make the network of decentralised systems so large and diverse that it is independent and resilient as a swarm, so to speak. And on the other hand, to control the network centrally. Hmm, true. Without central energy control for the whole of Europe, we wouldn't be able to access solar power from southern Spain on demand. But... We only need it in dark periods, because otherwise we have 20 million small power plants that produce and store electricity. That's right. You can't completely control the sun and wind. If you really think about it, that was a huge step. When all European countries merged their electricity grids as well as the regulation of them. No country could have managed energy independence on its own. <laughs> but that's how it works. In any case, your grandfather probably won't need all those plastic cards anymore. There is absolute unity in Europe when it comes to energy. Yes. But thankfully, not when it comes to football. <gasps> Otherwise, we might as well get rid of the European Championship. <laughs> what you've listened to is our utopia. The best case scenario, so to say. A potential future world of true collaboration within the energy sector. In all of our podcast episodes, we will kick off with a short introduction to set the scene on what a bright future could look like. And then we dive into a discussion on how to get there. Welcome to Decoding the Future of Energy, a Siemens Accelerator podcast. My name is Gerard Reed. I work in the finance industry with a focus on both the energy transition and the digital energy revolution. As your podcast host, I want to explore a range of facets on how we can develop a more or even fully sustainable energy world. Today's episode is all about independence. For this topic, we have two great guests, Thomas Godschalk, founder of the Access to Energy Institute, and Michael Schwann, head of Power Technologies International at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. Michael, Thomas, it's really great to have you on the show here. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us, Jared. I'd really love to talk about energy independence and also this sort of centralization versus decentralization and how you see that. And maybe I'd sort of kick off with sort of the whole decentralization versus centralization theme. I mean, we're all working from home today. And the reason we're able to do that and do this podcast virtually is because of decentralized technologies. And I'd love to really hear your views on how you see decentralized energy technologies and will it have a similar impact as the internet has had on our lives going forward? Yeah, maybe if I can start, it's always difficult to compare to the very, very, very big thing like the internet. But um, for sure, in the energy sector, decentralization 
is is really a key topic. And I mean, we, we are there already <clears throat> in Germany today. We already have more than two million uh, rooftop PV installations on residential homes uh, connected to low voltage, and this will increase. So everyone who thinks, uh, yeah, now we have done it, let's look into something else. Uh, this is just plain wrong. Uh, we, we will all be surprised how much and how fast we will see more decentralized energy, active energy uh, elements come up in, in our systems. Well, Jerry, I spent the last 12 years um, supporting the electrification of a million people with decentralized, really off-grid decentralized energy devices. And looking at my house and looking at the situation today, I have around 50 kilowatt peak solar and there's snow outside. So there's zero power coming from my PV modules. So, so much to be decentralized, right? So I think it's a little bit like how decentralized or what the definition of decentralized uh, is. So for me today, uh, I'm very happy that there's a centralized energy network around me. So, so does that mean going forward, guys, that we're going to still have a centralized network or do you see decentralized taking over or is it going to be a mix of the two? It will be a mix, I think. Um, because of some special characteristics in, in our region also. We all know we are now in the winter season. So um, unless houses have uh, impressive 50 kilowatt peak like you have, Thomas, um, there, there is lesser production on, on such uh, technologies like PV, sometimes even wind when we have stable weather. And, and this is when we will need to have some backup resources. And for the backup resources, uh, there there might be still economies of scale as long as we talk about things like gas fired uh, power plants fired of course uh, eventually on green hydrogen or, or even larger things for the shorter cycling like pump storage plants so there is economy of scale and for overall stability from the networks uh, from the system perspective the central grid definitely does has advantages over the Uh, um, individual islanded grids. That's the important thing. And, and there is no contradiction between these two statements. Generation will become decentral to a very large uh, extent, but the management of the system and the network, uh, there is big advantages of having this um, uh, a central solution. I think, Jared, it's as well, in, are we talking about electricity or are we talking energy? So I just ordered a heat pump, which will hopefully arrive before Christmas. But again, a heat pump with um, solar modules which are covered in snow, it doesn't really help. So at the moment I have a, a wood fire, I have a, a natural gas uh, heating as well. So I'm a little bit doubtful that uh, at least for the, the northern part of Germany, the complete decentralized path is actually viable. Many regions in the world, it's it's very viable. So as I said, you know, we electrified around a million people with a completely off-grid solar device and that worked very well. So I think that you have to differentiate where where you're talking, uh, which region you're talking about. Yeah, and what, what the situation is, Thomas, I assume that uh, the, the examples that you referenced here, it is people who first time get access to electricity. And, and then, of course, it is a very viable option to not wait for the large central infrastructures to be built, which takes time, which is expensive anywhere in the world. Um, so then, of course, completely decentral, fully autonomous uh, um, islanded solutions are faster and, and very efficient. Uh, but, but in places where we have the central grid already, there is these advantages and, and we have it. I mean, the grid is, is, is existing. And I mean, we see it also looking at the same uh, figure, two million houses with rooftop PV, uh, very, very, very small, really a negligible share of these houses has actually isolated from the grid. So somehow we also see it just in real life. Um, and yeah, th th there is at the moment and for the time being, no real advantage uh, to, to separate from the grid if the grid is existing already. Like the only thing I would add, though, is, um, is the whole theme of energy independence. And I had um, a very simple example, actually, in my little village, and I live outside Berlin in a small little village. I recently visited a neighbor who's basically gone off grid. And the reason he's gone off grid is not because of economics or anything like that. It's just energy independence, right? That was his drive. So he's not thinking about economics. He's thinking of energy independence. And I could imagine that that trend now intensifies going forward, right? Because you just, you know, I think people are realizing is, I can actually do without coal. I can do without oil. I can't do without electricity. We can't do anything without electricity, right? 
That's right. Electricity is is the key form of energy that is most versatile in usage. Uh, and I mean, also all the discussions, I mean, the, the big background of renewables, of the decentralization is, of course, decarbonization. And as a matter of fact, uh, most, by far, most of the technologies to, to convert renewable energy sources into some form of energy that, that we can use means we generate electricity. Um, and and it's, it's right that you mentioned it. It's a good example that, yes, very few houses in places like Germany, very few people did disconnect from the systems. And if they do, it is today for sure not uh, for economic reasons, because you need a lot of special control equipment to manage a stable island grid on your own. Uh, but yes, autarky as a value in itself is becoming important to people. And I fully agree if people in places like Europe uh, will disconnect from the grid, it's most likely for, for, for such reasons, yeah. And I, I don't know if they're necessarily going to decouple from the grid. It's just they're going to use it in a completely different way. It's more, hey, listen, I just want to be dependent on myself or my neighbors for this electricity because it's so important. But I would like to hear, Thomas, your thoughts in, in Africa going forward. I mean, how, did, how do you see the future of the, of the African electricity system, right? And that's where you've done a lot of work. Yeah, I think that as well you have to differentiate whether you are in, in a city like Kigali or Nairobi or Dar es Salaam or whether you are in the outskirts, you know, whether you're 50 kilometers away from Nairobi um, where the, the chances that there's no grid are pretty high. And the chances that the grid is arriving there um, in in due time um, is maybe not so high. And you know the available sunshine is a very different story than the available sunshine here in the winter in Germany. Uh, makes a lot of sense huh, to to go um, for an island solution. We see that in Australia that you know where if sunshine is available, if it's not so seasonal uh, like in, in Germany, it makes actually quite some sense to go independent from the grid or you, you are able, you're actually able to go independently from the, the grid supply. So I think for many um, regions where there's steady sunshine throughout the year, the major share of energy will be produced on their own roof. They might be connected to the grid, they might not be connected to the grid. Um, I think uh, the that's the beauty of living in warmer regions that you don't have those cold and gray days as you have here in Germany or Northern Europe. Where, you know, if if you want to include storage into your house, you need so much storage um, because you have to bridge a few days or a few weeks without much sunshine um, that it's only possible for very um, affluent people. Um, uh, Michael, what are your thoughts? That's very true. And as Thomas said, I mean, the, the question is how much renewable uh, energy is provided at your place from the sun via wind, uh, whatever. And uh, how long is the period when most likely renewable generation because of the weather conditions will be below the current demand? Um, and, and we also see it in the Middle East, for example, where, of course, we have also lots of sunshine um, up to very large scale developments. Uh, the, the NEOM project in Saudi Arabia, for example, I mean, there even a multi-million uh, city uh, will be able to, to be supplied completely from renewable energies. And, and the dark period where, where the generation is below demand, it is not two to three months like we have it here in, in, in Europe. It is not even two weeks. So so then we are coming into a range when even this uh, period can indeed be covered mainly from, from storage. Yeah. Can I ask you sort of, uh, we take independence to a European level. I think what you, you see across Europe now is governments realizing, wow, we, we need to become more energy independent. Can I ask you both just how you think we do that? Well, you know, I think it's interesting that that needed to have, to, for governments to understand that independence uh, is important, that we needed to have a war for that, uh, for governments to understand that. I think, you know, if, if you count one and one together, you know, and even 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, would have said, well, you know, what is important for Europe? Oh, it's, it's energy. And, you know, what can we do? Oh, there's wind, there's solar. We can have interconnected grids. We, we can build supply in the north, in the, in the south. 
um, with wind, we can have our solar arrays connected. Um, so it's it's sad, you know, that we need to have a war for governments to basically say, hey, you know, let's be energy independent. I mean, all the billions and billions of dollars which are spent on on gas imports or coal imports or what, whatever energy imports, if we would have left them in Europe, you know, that would have been, I think, such a success story for an economic um, growth and economic development within in Europe. But that was politically not wanted, uh, I think, uh, in the early 2000s. So, yeah, I think, you know, let's go more renewable. Let's interconnect uh, the the windy regions with the um, hydro regions, with the sunny regions, and really reduce the dependence on on energy, which is not created renewably within Europe. And I think that's, we have so much potential to do so. I mean, um, Michael is referring to the 2 million solar systems on uh, German house rooftops. So let's have 10, 15, 20, 25 million or 40 million of those. And, you know, let's let's move that needle. Let's have more windmills where the, the wind is uh, um, shining. That's, uh, uh, sorry, blowing. Let's interconnect with other countries. And um, I think that's what we could have done 10, 15 years ago, really pushing um, for it when it was clear that renewables price for electricity will come down. It's, and it's only a function of mass production. So I think that's what we need to concentrate on. That's fully right. And um, d definitely we are suffering nowadays that we, we did not progress as fast and now uh, in retrospective, maybe not even uh, nearly as fast as we could have moved if there would have been more focus and more push and support um, for uh, re renewable generation. So the thing is in, in Europe, and we discussed this before already, the, the key thing is not only the renewable generation, but these winter seasons. When, when whatever renewable generation we will build, and of course, overbuilding to extreme cases, uh, suddenly the gap will become lower, but there will remain a gap um, where we need to have additional energy delivered, also electricity when we start on the electricity system uh, during times when we do not have enough uh, wind and PV generation. And, and and this is the question, will we be able to build enough electrolysis uh, capacity, for example, to produce our own green hydrog hydrogen, or do we continue to import primary energy in the form of green hydrogen? also from other countries. But if we would do so, and I think this is indeed what also politics hopefully have learned the hard way by now, do not focus on one or two more or less difficult uh, countries and regions where to get the supply from, but by diversify and, and make sure uh, that you have a lot of uh, sources also from, let's say, stable uh, countries. And, and the good thing is, in general, Uh, th there is more potential around the globe to produce green hydrogen than we have natural gas resources, for example. So in, in principle, uh, we are all set to have a much more diversified uh, infrastructure here. Yeah, I think the one thing that keeps comes to my mind is cooperation. Is um, And the reason I say that, if I think of my, my neighbor going and trying to go off grid, it's, it is at an incredible cost. It would have been much better if he decided to do it with some of his neighbors. And if I take that beyond that, actually... That's what we should be doing in Europe. We need to be working with each other across border to make sure that Europe can can gain this energy independence, right? And I think that's a key thing, right? I think that's the the absolute key thing. And you know, it's I think that's it's funny, huh? It's a combination of being decentralized. So you know, your neighbor having his or her solar panels on the roof and having a battery somewhere. But as well, you know, having an interconnector to Portugal, to the coast of France and to the Scandinavian countries to really benefit from the um, regional uh, renewable energy availability. So it's, I think it's both. Huh? It goes hand, hand in hand to reduce the, the energy needed per household by just in, increasing their energy, renewable energy share production uh, on their roof or in their garden or wherever they do it. But as well, just really interconnect, interconnect, and interconnect. I think that's that's the secret. There's so much renewable um, the sunshine and wind for on on the European continent, plenty more than what we actually need. We just have to realize it and have to ensure that the electrons which are produced in Ireland with the Irish wind, you know, are somehow transported to to Poland, and vice versa. So I think that's the magnificent of the the job which is uh, ahead of us to to be connected. That's very true. And this is really 
the background uh, of all the energy transition. And I always have this slide in the presentation when I talk about energy transition, the famous desert tech study back from 2005, 2006, um, where already back then the, the technology to create energy is available. It is really more a challenge of distributing uh, the energy to where it's needed from the places where we generate it and to make sure that we cover those periods. But in, in total, the energy balance in itself is, uh, honestly speaking, less of a challenge. Yes. Can I ask you both about sort of, um, you both are engineers. Uh, I'm not. And I'd, I'd love to hear your view on, you know, the most exciting technologies you see going forward in this whole area of sort of decentralized energy and energy independence. And, if, and why? Michael, you go first. That's, Ah, that's a very good one. And I would have asked you to go first because indeed <laughs> uh, this makes us engineers think, obviously. Um, and the other key statement uh, when I talk about uh, energy transition is that we have all the technologies available. So, so this is why I need now to think about your question. Um, and, and honestly speaking, I think we have much more of a challenge really in the secondary systems and technologies, meaning communication control, uh, um, between all the different uh, and now many more active players in the energy system, because this is what we don't have at the moment. Um, so we somehow need to talk to these, again, 2 million uh, rooftop PV uh, um, installations in Germany, which we are not doing today. Uh, and of course, in principle, we would know how to talk from one computer to the other, but somehow we, we don't do it. And this is really a key thing that's blocking us. The primary technology really is less of a problem. Obviously, we have these installations, we have tons of home storages already, but making sure that all these things work together smartly for the benefit of the overall system and, of course, uh, uh, meeting the needs of the individuals, th th this is still a, a key challenge. So I understand that. So you're talking really about digitalization, software and controls, really, and, and how that works going forward, right? Which is not clear at present. Jared, I'm not a very good engineer, but you know, um, I believe that <laughs> most of, or actually all, all, all what we need is available, right? We have really efficient wind turbines, we have very efficient solar panels, we have batteries which work. I just recently had a, a conversation with a colleague in France, and he couldn't believe that you know we don't have our smart meters across rolled out in Germany, right? He he was sure that Germany must be so ahead because. Uh, you know, apparently it's it's done in France. Everybody has their smart meter or the digital meter, and you know when he heard that it's you know that we are lagging so far behind in Germany, he, you know, he was wondering about this engineering um, nation. And f for me, it's sort of like what is lacking is not a, a technology development or an innovation. You know, we see that is happening as we are speaking. Solar panels become more efficient. Batteries become cheaper. Windmills became so much more efficient over the last year. So all of that is happening and it's available. And actually in the end, it's mostly it's regulations. With two friends, I have a, a large solar array on a on the roof of a, um, of a storage unit and we have um, tenants underneath it. And it's impossible for us to sell the electricity which is produced on the rooftop to those tenants underneath there um, without like crazy hurdles. And those hurdles are only made through regulations. It's not, it's not that we have to invent more technology to sell the electricity which is produced on the rooftop to the tenants which are working underneath it. It's just simply a regulatory nightmare which we have uh, at least here in germany and probably as well across europe so i think we what we need is uh, like uh, deregulation or a, a, a different regulation and we need to have politicians who really say well wow, let's imagine how the future could look like or should look like and let's work towards it and i think that has happened that that hasn't happened over the last 15 years uh, at least in germany where it was I feel in many ways actually in the opposite side. You know, how can we make it more difficult for renewables to actually be utilized? And, you know, how can we spread um, the, the, the distribution of them? Yeah, so, so I also rephrase my answer and uh, fully agree with Thomas here. Yes, the, the biggest challenge actually is on the side of processes and regulation. Uh, because, I mean, on top of the examples that you have just mentioned, I mean, it is even to the point that 
technical capabilities, technical potentials that we have already today in the installations that are out there in the field uh, are not even used uh, nor fully leveraged. I mean, everyone is also talking about flexibility, uh, just thinking about uh, flexibility in renewable generation to use the potentials that today's at least modern wind turbines, modern PV inverters can offer. And we are not doing it because it is not foreseen in the regulations. So this is really a big chunk of work that's ahead of us there. Jerry, you know, I have a 72, 75 kilowatt battery in my electric car, right? Perfect home storage opportunity, right? Vehicle to grid. Is that possible in Germany? No, it's not. And, you know, that's just like, you know, you wonder, why isn't that, why isn't that not working? So why can't I use that uh, battery storage as grid balancing as an uh, as a solution when there's snow on my uh, pv panels so i think that is the issue it's not the, the the technology it's not the innovation which is um which is lagging behind it's the regulations which is uh, too complex but surely the good news is that you know the, this drive for energy independence across europe starting with governments but also to the end customer who are all putting in solar they're putting in heat pumps they're putting in batteries Surely that's now going to force change in these regulations to make this transition easier. Yeah, and you know, I think what's going to be really important is the, the influence of of lobby groups, right? I mean, what was Gazprom putting a hundred million dollars of lobby investment every year into the the European context, continent? So I think that needs to to stop. Uh, we need to really think through how this energy transition can be done without trying to please big corporations, but trying to ensure that there is an in energy independence and then that it works for the households uh, in the countryside or in, in the cities. And that, you know, energy regulations are not made by big and large um, cooperatives. Yeah, so, so we are seeing the first steps. Uh, Thomas, you also mentioned smart meters, for example, where indeed I can only confirm uh, internationally, no one can understand why we in Germany do not yet have smart meters. But just now, really going on right now, um, our government is trying to do a restart on the smart meter rollout by simplifying the requirements and, and making it more, more practical. And let's see whether the spirit... A, is successful, and B, will then also be transported into other areas. Can I ask one thing, just as me as the non-engineer? I mean, I'm surprised neither of you actually sort of mentioned storage, right? Because I would have thought that's like the holy grail of decentralized energy, right? Or am I looking at this wrong? Or Yeah, no, it's certainly the holy grail. I have 33 kilowatt hours of storage in my house, so... It's there, right? So it's, you know, it was expensive to put it in, but, you know, I put it in three years ago. So today it would be, I think, 30% less. So it's just just uh, um, uh, just scaling it, right? Just making it available and um, the innovation around is happening. So again, the technology is there. It's not that, you know, we still have to wait for it. We still may have to wait for it so that it becomes extremely cheap, but it becomes, you know, it will become extremely cheap through scale. That's what we saw with PV panels. Right, you could have bought a PV panel like 15 years ago for a thousand dollars each panel. Today you buy it for a hundred dollars. So similar developments will wait for us in the battery sector. But it needs to be empowered. You know, it needs to be enabled, um, and that more and more people are doing it. I think this year we we see a huge chunk of batteries being installed in Germany. So we will see, uh, yeah, quite a, a price drop over the coming years just due to more capacity building in the production side and more innovation in the, in the product development. So for sure, storage is important. And I mean, we did talk about storage, by the way. Maybe we didn't name everything storage. Um, and I mean, as Thomas said, yes, we will have. And, and, and part of the story is, I think we, we already have much more storage in our system, uh, more than a few years ago, and much more than maybe most people would actually imagine. It is home storage connected to a lot of these rooftop PV plants. It is the electric cars that are now coming. I mean, this is electricity storage. Uh, um, we are getting storages in, in conventional power plants, by the way, where today already a large share of our balancing power uh, is sold by the entity th that is named a, a power plant, but it's actually coming out of the battery, not of the coal-fired uh, generator. And I mean, ultimately, I, I was talking already about the gas-fired plants for the dark period in winter in Germany. 
And of course, it should be green hydrogen. Um, and, and then we need storage because green hydrogen, if we produce it in, 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 in Germany, in Europe, it will be produced during summer when we have lots of wind and PV. It will be stored uh, in the gas caverns that we do have available already. We only need to do it. We know this since 10, 20 years or even longer, but we need to get going and we need to, we need to get faster. Can I switch themes a little bit and talk about centralization, which is, right, if I look at, say, what's going on in the North Sea, what we're doing is we're building out a whole pile of offshore wind. And actually, the most sensible thing seems to be that you would you would connect countries together. And you would also then realize, well, actually, a lot of the loads is not in, you know, the, in, in Northern Europe. It's actually it's down in Northern Italy. It's in Southern Germany. So this means you have to sort of build out the grid, right? Um, which has been troublesome up to now. And I'm, I suppose I'd love to hear your views on that and whether there's technical solutions that we can use to actually get more, you know, po more power down existing lines, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'm, I'm living close to you, Jared, right? So I'm living east of Berlin, 60 kilometers east of Berlin. And I was traveling up and down Brandenburg where Nord Stream 2 was built. Right, and I, I don't know actually how long it took, but it didn't took very long to build that massive pipeline uh, going through federal state things uh, in, in Germany. So you know, it, um, so it seems to be possible to build infrastructure uh, if it is sort of like pushed and done. So the, the the question is, you know, is it really so difficult to build then power lines from the northern um, Germany to the southern Germany? Is it regulatory? Is it uh, is it emotional? Is is what what is it actually? So the the pipeline was built in uh, quite some speed, right? So whenever we drove down those streets, we saw, who, oh, you know, again a kilometer further uh, done and this is done and that is done. So uh, again, I think that we don't have to invent as well some technology to make it happen. Um, we, we have great DC um, power lines, which are extremely efficient and which need to be put in place. Yeah, and it's a good example. And most likely um, the, the story is the same, not only for gas pipelines, but for electricity transmission lines as well. Building these things actually is not a problem and it doesn't take too much time. But the approval process to come to the point that you can start building, this is where in Germany it still takes us 10 to 15 years, which obviously is, is a time frame that's completely out of range for the pace of change that we require uh, here and as we're discussing. But I mean, Gerard, to your point, of course, you're right. We Offshore wind is, is obviously something which is not decentral at all. I mean, the individual wind turbine still is small. Um, but of course, for yeah, just giving the, the situation of the installation offshore, it is connected to the onshore systems or to any form of power system in large chunks. And we need to transport it. And, and we did not discuss so much. We always discussed about more the households, the rooftop PV. Um, Germany is a rather industrialized country uh, across Europe. We have a lot of uh, heavy industry, also a lot of uh, modern industry, by the way, data centers are huge consumers of power, large data centers, easily five, six, seven hundred megawatt. So we have these large consumers that will have no chance to produce um, energy locally. Uh, so we need to transport. We can do it. We need to think how to do it clever. Um, as a matter of fact, power lines uh, today, even in the transmission space, uh, you're actually constrained by technology to a few gigawatt per line system. A gas pipeline has an order of magnitude higher uh, capacity uh, in energy if you convert the um, value of gas, for example, to electricity. So we, we need to think how to do it clever. But again, technology is there. And what is important to understand, it, it might not add to decentralization, what we were discussing today, but for independence, it is important to have a generation mix. So to use offshore wind power, because the characteristic of generation, meaning when is the wind available out at sea, is significantly different um, from the onshore wind characteristic. So in general, this is helping a lot to increase the independence uh, of our energy supply. Michael, can I, can I ask you about something that you mentioned earlier on? which was just the whole hydrogen thing. And I'd like to ask you your views on, on power to gas and whether you were actually going to produce it centrally or decentralized, or is it going to be a mix of that? 
That's a good question. I, and I know there's a lot of people who say, yeah, it needs to be central for economy of scale. Uh, but but honestly, I, I think we will see a mix, to put it short, um, because it's the same like with PV or with wind. The individual electrolyzer is a rather small module. Uh, so yes, you may have some scaling effects, but it is not huge. And we easily can imagine applications where also on a smaller distributed level, it will make sense to use uh, the flexibility for, for balancing in a local area and not only on the large central um, system. Thomas, do you have any view, a view on that? Um, I'm not very deep in green hydrogen. I've been adopting uh, green hydrogen for a long time, but that really depends, or that really is, I'm, I'm so far away from it. So, you know, I, I hope it's not only just in... A new technology which is uh, brought in by the big corporates to, you know, replace natural gas with, with green hydrogen to have another story which they can sell. Um, so that's fine. Yeah, and I think we see first examples, by the way. So, so the the green hydrogen installations that we have by today. I, I don't know yet the gigawatt scale uh, uh, installation. There is always discussions on these things, but it has not materialized. Um, but for example, some villages in Germany, some communities who are already looking very actively into the energy topic, they are starting to get hydrolyzers, uh, um, uh, electrolyzers on their own because it, it helps them to store energy for the winter season and, and to also produce heat. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, also very important to produce heat out of um, the green hydrogen, which, which is much easier than to replace fossil fuels on these um, use cases. What I'm hearing from both of you is that it's not one or the other. So in other words, it's not centralized or decentralized, it's both. And in fact, if we want to become more energy independent, we actually have to embrace both decentralization and centralization, which is sort of something new, if I may say. Am I hearing that right from both of you? Definitely a yes from me. I mean, like I said before, it sounds like a contradiction yeah. and it is not. I mean, as a matter of fact, we will have a massive decentralization on the generation side, but uh, we need to distribute some of the generation across the country, even across countries. And uh, this is most efficient done in a central system, which will not do all of the job. We might even see local hydrogen applications, for example, like we just discussed, but there will, let's say, remain enough work to do for, for the big system. Yeah, Jared, it's, I think it's decentralized energy uh, production distributed centrally or distributed huh, to, to where it is needed. Okay, very good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was, that was enjoyable. Yeah, thank you. The statement that Michael made and Thomas underlined fits the episode's topic really well. Generation will become decentralized to a large extent, but there's a big advantage of having a central solution for the management of the system. Bottom line is that is not about decentralized versus centralized solutions or independence versus dependence, but instead about the best way forward. And the truth is in the middle between all of these variables. If you would like to learn more about everything we talked about today, I can recommend a visit to the Siemens Grid software website at siemens.com backslash grid minus software, as well as the Siemens Smart Infrastructure LinkedIn and Twitter channels. You find all the links in the podcast description. And if you have any questions concerning the topics discussed in today's episode, please feel free to email us at grid.software.si at siemens.com.